Okay. Uh, hey, first question. Welcome in, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope the weather is fine. Kaylin, we've been missing you, girl. Where you been? I was here on Tuesday. I just didn't have my video on. Okay. Well, we and I was here you. Thursday. Okay. It's been it's been a lot. What is school? A my lot husband or... left. Um, no, your deployed. husband left you. Her husband left her. Yep. No, tell him to come back. No, come back. Oh no, I'm just joking. It's funny. The boat actually broke, and so they had to stop in Ketchikan and get the boat fixed. So. I was like, oh, no, if you were closer, I would drive up there. But my daughter broke her wrist the week after he left. So it's like, you know, when he leaves, the levee just breaks. And <laughs> Oh, bless your heart. Yeah, that's rough. God, look at my hair. Everything what bad hell? happens when they leave. Potty mouth, money in the jar. Potty mouth, money in the jar, yes. Yeah, that, I know. I'll spend I six months with him here and nothing. Like not a thing, not even like a snow, a, sto a snowstorm. And then as soon as he leaves, like it's snowing, we got snow days. And what is that? What is that? That's this, is that that's that's more than Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, will go wrong. But if it can go wrong when he's away, there's got to be another level to Murphy's Law, right? There's got to be something else. Where's Shannon at today? Shannon's not here. Jawan normally comes in late, so we're used to him being there. Well, for the few of you that come in live, I appreciate y'all coming in. I really, really do. Hey, let's talk for a second about our friend Tom Shoshnoff uh, and his um, time with us. Any takeaways from that? I'm curious as to what you guys thought about Tom. We're all too quiet. What's wrong with y'all? <laughs> It's raining in Alabama. I don't know about everywhere else. Oh, it's raining here in Georgia too. It's raining, raining and it's it's getting cold. Everybody wants to take a nap. Work, so yeah, everybody wants to take a nap. Yeah, right. Katie, what do um, you think about Tom? What do you think about Tom? And it won't hurt my feelings if nobody likes Tom too. That's fine. I, I no, love Tom. he was so extremely dedicated to that like one specific thing. You know, like, and I think that's admirable in some people as far as how they can be just so singularly focused and it was like business make money let's figure it out I don't I, I mean I, I my personality type is that one of I want to achieve and I want to do the things that I set out to but I just want to achieve a little bit more and not just work so it it was a way for me to realize I may not be the most uber successful person that society is going to say wow look what all he accomplished but I kind of looked at what did he miss out on too? Yeah. That, that was hard. Isabel, what you, you, you wanted to come in on that maybe? No, I was just agreeing. Like when, when you said that he uh, told his kids that Disneyland burnt down, like those are memories that you'll never get back. So I agree that he probably put his <clears throat> family on the back burner too much, maybe, but yeah, I, mean, it's, I it's, would love to tell my kids that Disney burnt. Uh, that's the last place I want to take my kids. I don't, that doesn't sound glorious and wonderful to me, but I'm not going to tell them a lie to not take them. <laughs> I'm just going to be like, God created better places than Disney. Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> Well, and it's strange too, right? That you go, the man doesn't have to work, but yet he's there, you know, six hours or more a day doing live content, you know, behind the camera. Um, and he takes very few vacations. I wish he would have um, explained a little bit more about like when I asked him what would be the first thing that he would teach somebody, he just kind of bounced around my question. He just kind of said, well, you got to figure out if you really want this. Like, obviously, we're in financing, so we really want this. But like, I really wanted him to try to like, say one specific thing that he would teach somebody that was in this industry 
Yeah, that, that if you really want this is a hard thing because if you don't fully grasp it, how do you know if you want it or not? Yeah, like, I mean, I've gotten this far. Like, obviously, I've put in so much money. I, I want to do it. If not for the public, I want to do it for myself. So. One of the things I've heard him say time and time again is quick decision making. You know, develop quick decision making. Take a stand, make a decision, and go with it. For example, in his organizations, they don't have extremely long meetings, right? So if you're having a meeting with everybody, you should be able to finish that meeting in 30 minutes or less, which is good. Because think about how many meetings you've gone to. My God, you made me say this class. I can't believe we stay here for an hour most of the day. You know, why don't we get out earlier? Why don't we just cover what we got to cover and leave? So, you know, quick decisions. If you have to have a meeting, make it actually count. Don't fluff and, and go on with it. I think that's pretty good. Now, what I think was a real big takeaway that I hope that you guys got was this. Surround yourself with people that, you know, we always say about that are smarter than you. Not necessarily smarter than you, but that that complements you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a secret of your success. At your office or your business or your financial planning business that you're going to have one day or your whatever. You know, surround yourself with people who are good at what they do and are great compliments to what you do. And hopefully, Katie, at your business there, you know, you're surrounded by people who are good at things that you are not good at. I'm finding a way to bring those people in because we, with us, we're kind of set up in regions. So you have these people and a lot of people try to assert themselves as that. And I've had to tell a few of them, like, I don't respect the business you're building and I don't want you to even like encroach on me back off, you know, and I'm at that point now where I've, I'm learning more of what I do want and what I don't. And so it's, it's pushing out those that I don't want around me because you, when you come into a profession pretty new, you kind of try to connect with everybody and then you learn Who's building a business that I respect? Who is in it for the money and not their clients? And unfortunately, when you get into this, you will find those people. And it's on the inside looking out, it's so obvious is who those people are. But unfortunately, from the outside looking in, it's not, you know, and those are people that I don't want around me. And unfortunately, I don't want to serve their clients because I don't want to take on that mess. But in my office, I do. I mean, y'all, y'all kind of seen Sharon a time or two, and I love Sharon. She's not here right now, so I have to say all of that. <laughs> but she compliments me in a way that I can serve my clients and be focused here. And I know that the fluff that I don't bring because I'm very direct, she is going to make my clients feel what I don't. So it it, it balances us. Katie, I bet that you don't have a problem and this is where a lot of us get into trouble i bet you don't have a problem telling people no no <laughs> no i don't so it, well i yeah. do with some there are some and 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 my hardest no is for people who are trying to get started and so i have had to develop a way because I can't take on tons of new clients because that burdens me down from being able to serve those that are more established. But I don't want to tell a brand new investor no, because if I tell them no, who's going to tell them yes? And that's the hardest no for me is because I know what kind of future they can have. And so in order, and I think I've shared this in order for me to work with new investors, I say you've got to invest in yourself. And that means you're setting up an automated savings of some amount that we determine is is capable. And that's if they say no to that, then I can easily say no. Well, and I bet, though, that you probably rather than just telling them no, drop dead, that maybe you have a referral or someone that you can refer them to. Right. That can help them. You know, you say I would love to take on you as a client and to help steer your financial future. However, 
it would be a disservice to my existing clients and take away from the time that they've already, you know, needed from me. However, I am more than happy to refer you to a qualified professional that could help you. I bet that's probably something that you do. That's hard because where I am in this little town, there are nine advisors here with my firm. There are nine advisors. Nine, and then two retired. And so you can't even come into this town without a book, you know, and where do I refer? Because a lot of those advisors are referring to me. And I have had the conversation with a few of if we need to sit down, I think that it might be an online platform for you that's not going to be as exp- I've had that conversation and it feels weird because you want to do right by your firm, but you've got to do right by someone else. And I had one who was like, I refuse it, Katie. You will be my advisor. I was like, okay, you know I'm expensive compared to what you and she's she's like but I need your guidance and that's I have to have the accountability partner and that's what I'm paying you for so okay because I I, where do I refer I can't so that's why that no is very hard Bobby you know the client that did that to you that's what I did to my personal trainer you know I go into the gym I'm the fat guy in the gym they only think I'm going to be there six weeks they're going to sign me up for a year contract And then I sign up for personal trainer. And so the fitness director takes me through, shows me everything and does a workout with me. And I said, okay, I want to do personal training. She says, I'm going to set you up with Theo. I said, no, no, actually you're not. I said, you have already seen my naked feet when I got on the scale to to do the body analyzer. I said, uh, I'm missing one toe. I had to have it amputated because of my diabetes. I said, you've seen that. I said, I'm not showing that to another person. You're going to be my trainer. She says, I don't have time. I said, well, you'll make time. And so we've been working together for a year now. And she's going to be my trainer until I'm in my 80s. Right. So, you know, and and she'll often say, I'm glad I took you on. I didn't accept no for an answer, you know, from her. So it was hard for her to say no to me, even though she said no initially. That's The hard thing is when you've got somebody who like, I'm willing to say no. And then yeah. you come up against somebody else who's not willing. I mean, they're willing to say no. And you're like, well, who's going to win this here? And it works out when you both have the future forward plan and best interest at heart. But Isabel, Kaylin, Katie, and I'm, I'm calling on three. We got, uh, you know, 12 people in here. I could call on anybody, but I call on y'all because I can see your faces. Um. Talking back to Sosna, you don't have to create a billion dollar business though to be more successful than Tom. And I hope everybody sees that. You don't have to have a billion dollars of business to be successful. My family is more important than doing everything that is necessary of me to build the billion dollar business. I coach softball. I'm here with my kids. This, this, they'll be coming in, you know, any minute now. Um, I go to the school events. I go to all of that. And to me, I wouldn't trade that for anything. And they don't like it or appreciate it now, but they will when they're later on, you know, that I don't have to work. I don't have to do a job. I'm retired other than me teaching the classes that I teach. Um, I'm in a great position, but it's not that I want to create the bill, billion dollar business. I'm very comfortable. And I would say in many aspects, uh, because of the balance in my life, that I'm very successful. So I hope that you guys, from listening to someone like Tom, that you don't take that you have to have a certain monetary amount in order for you to be successful. Any comments on that? I just want y'all to see that. The balance in your lives gives you success. Kaylin. I was going to let Evan go. He put his hand up. I just realized I have a hand button. Yeah, you got a hand button. Well, go ahead and then we'll let Evan go. Okay, so one of the things I guess that I wish that 
we could have seen more from Tom was him actually using the thinkorswim platform. Mm -hmm. Like I really like when you show us, you know, step by step how to do things. But since he created it, I guess I was kind of hoping like, you know, for some little tricks and secrets that we don't know this program does or that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That, that's great. Yeah, to be more, you know, and maybe I could have led him that way. Because I, I, I basically told him, hey, Tom, I want to talk about risk. I want to make sure that these students know take risk. Because, you know, a lot of people say we were born to die. But we weren't born to die. We were born to live. And I do want you to take risk. I don't want you to sacrifice your family by taking the risk. But I do want you to take risk. I want you to be in the market. I want you to be invested. I don't want you to wait till you finish school. I don't want you to wait till next week. I want you. And I've heard some of your conversations in your discussion groups. Hey, I'm starting now. So I think the message is getting to some of you. I'm, I'm not waiting. I'm doing it now. Whether it's $10 a week or $10 a month, you're starting now. Evan, go ahead. I was just going to comment on your not needing to make billions of dollars to be successful yeah. um, thing. And I was, I was talking to uh, my wife, Maisie, the other day about kind of some of our, our monetary goals and stuff. And, and we really quickly realized that we can't name a single successful person from 150 or 200 years ago. And the reality is, you know, we, as a society, we kind of measure success by how much money you have or how many things you have. But when you die, that money, sure, it gets passed down to your family. Uh, eventually that money runs out or people kind of lose track of where it came from. And nobody really cares that you made a billion dollars or $2 billion. So why not make a, a more reasonable amount, you know, maybe for, for you, that's a million dollars or $10 million and then spend that time with your family, spend that time making an impact on people uh, and, and kind of living your life that way. I, I think the whole billionaire lifestyle seems awesome, but like you said, it's, it's very unnecessary in order to feel like you've lived a successful or, or happy life. Uh, and, and in the end, nobody really cares about how much money you made uh, or, or how quote unquote successful you were. Um, I mean, you know, people like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, they'll probably be remembered for a while, but even at some point they're going to be forgotten. So I, I think we all kind of get caught up in the whole money thing a little too much as a society. Yeah, you know, we want a street named after us or a, a building named after us or a plaque or something like that. And it doesn't matter. You're still going to be dead at some point, you know, and it's it's more important. I, what's more important to me, in, in other words, you know, when I retired in 2021, uh, you know, I was 51 years old. I could have done anything. I mean, I could have just sit back and, you know, just slept all day and watched the young and the restless, but I love teaching and spending time, you know, pouring into other people. And that's what I hope that you guys take away from this as well. Right. I want Katie to be involved in the schools, speaking to the schools. I want you guys speaking to your nieces and nephews and children and their friends and making a difference and making sure that they know that there is an alternate path that most people are not taking. And that brings us to the retirement gamble. For those of you that watch the retirement gamble, which is one of your assignments, how sad was that? Any, any comments that any of you guys have on the retirement gamble? Isabel, did you watch it? What, what were your thoughts on the retirement gamble? I can't remember what that one was about. Um, That's the one where, um, you know, there were, it was kind of an older frontline PBS video from 2013 where they were talking about fees. They had Jack Bogle in it uh, and people were woefully unprepared for retirement. Does that ring a bell? Yes, I do remember now um, the the couple that um, basically lost everything. That was super scary. Um, I was really surprised at how much um, the fees could eat up your retirement. That was pretty frightening for me. Um, I'm 44, and so I'm in that like halfway point 
of my life where we started our whole, you know, well, my husband started his, I didn't really have one, but he started his 401k TSP thing uh, when we were about 23 years old. And um, yeah, so to me, I think that that's really scary if it could eat up 61% of my retirement fund. And Bogle talks about that in his book, and he's got a couple of graphs in there, right, that shows you that the fees, and the fees, unfortunately, so many of them are hidden as well, right? They're just not easily disclosed. So how do you, Katie, when you're talking to a group of high school kids, how do we make delayed gratification and retirement look sexy? How, how, yeah, <laughs> how do you take an 18 year old kid who can't even see past today to let them see themselves in a retirement? It's, it's almost as if, you know, listen, Isabel, you never thought you'd be 44 years old. When you were 18, you never thought that was possible. I think one of the best things that you guys told me, who was it that told me, Katie, it may have been someone that was there with you, that, hey, if you don't do something, you're going to be in the same situation as your parents. That was Sharon. Sharon did that. And I think when I shared that with the group that I spoke with, it was almost like you saw them go, oh, my God. Because in the area that I'm at, so many parents struggle. You know, it was sad the other day. I was in Walmart and I was picking up some softballs or something for practice. And I saw a lady there with her two kids, you know, and they're like, Mama, I need a bat. Mama, I need a thing. And, you know, they're like, Well, I don't have the money for a bat. And I don't have, the, you know, it's, it's sad seeing these situations where, you know, these kids, they want to play the sports and they want to do all this stuff. And then the mom was like, I don't have money for a, a bat or I don't have money for a ball. I don't know. It's just incredibly, it's incredibly sad when you see our country and, and, and everybody just trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and thinking that you got to live such and such lifestyle or you're not going to be accepted by society, but y'all, we got to do something for these kids to, uh, do something toward their retirement. Social security was supposed to be forced re forced savings for retirement, but it is not. That's why I would love to see. Now y'all correct me on wrong, throw st stones at me at this, right? I would love to see a law passed that says, hey, social security, rather than going to the government and being paid back by the government in this large, what I would call a Ponzi scheme where the money's not really there and they're going ahead and, and spending it. The, the trust fund is really not a trust fund. It's being raided by our politicians. I would love it if there was a law that said of your salary, X percent, a small percentage, 3%, 5% goes into a fund that and I mean two or three funds at, at at most, but can you imagine if you put it into a total stock fund, even if it was a global stock fund or the S and P five hundred or something, rather than you know uh, something entirely safe, but uh, something that was related to equities? Can you imagine the wealth that would be created within this country? Throw stones at that, or do you support that? I support, I support it, but there's so, do you, do you really think that the government is taking that money and just pretending that it's sitting in account somewhere? I feel like they're, they're taking that money and they, they're making the money off of our money. So, and the reason why I think this is because when the government for us, the Air Force, when they do allotments for my husband's pay, um, we set out 
X amount of money to go into our savings account. Well, he would get paid on the first and he would also get paid on the 15th. Well, they would take half of, let's say it was $1,000 that they're putting into our savings account. They would take half of it on the first and then they would take half of it on the 15th and then they would make one deposit on the first into that savings account. Well, in my savings account, I could have been earning 500 or interest on that $500 that they held for 15 some odd days when they should have just taken the 500 from the first of the paycheck and the 500 from the 15th of the paycheck and just made two deposits. So they're stealing my money or our money, but I told my husband, stop all the allotments. I'll do the transfers myself because we were missing out on that 15 days of compound interest, basically. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I think the hard part is that until we educate our society in a way to manage money properly, which is going to be generations of undoing bad habits, if we allowed this, and even if we set it up as law, too many people in society would find a way to wreck it or to do what they shouldn't do and then still become a burden on society so we would create another problem that's my stone like for instance i have somebody who called the other day and said i need to take money out of my ira and i said for what because she's in her 40s for what and i don't get mad if you get mad at me for asking like what is that your business because I need to know if it's going to get a penalty or not and I said this is going to incur a penalty are you sure you want to do this well yeah I have no money in my emergency account I'm like this is not what you're supposed to do Katie mm -hmm. <gasps> so that like I get mad because I'm supposed to protect them from themselves and sometimes they don't let me but that's where I think that if we had something where it was more hands-on some people, unfortunately, will still find a way to make the wrong decision. So as far as getting kids, high schoolers, whatever, to think about the future, I think it kind of starts to trickle back down as something that we should teach at an even earlier age. So I've told y'all, I do a lot with middle schoolers. Um, I sub a lot of the classes for, that's what's paying for my um to take the financial planner exam. So it sucks, but it is what it is. So I got these kids and I'm like, please just do your work. Like, that's all I'm here for. Like, I want to teach you math. Let me teach you math. I'm begging you. And they're like, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm like, well, we're starting to plan for high school. You know, what are you guys going to do when you get in high school? What are you going to do after high school? And it's like nothing. They're just, their eyes glaze over and they're like, I don't care. I'm just worried about today, tomorrow. So even little things like that, it's like they can't wrap the head around that what they're doing today is benefiting them tomorrow. They, I get a lot of, um, well, this YouTuber and that YouTuber, this TikToker, they don't have to make money. And I'm like, you're not that TikToker. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say to these kids. And, you know, it just builds. And then they get in high school and it's the same thing. And then you got people like me that go speak to them and I'll probably never get asked back to the school again because, you know, I asked how many of them were going to college and, you know, there's like 40 people in the class and probably 99% of them raised their hand. And I said, that's entirely too many. And you should have seen the look on the teacher's face. Oh, you're telling these kids they shouldn't go to college. I use that too. So I think I've shared with this class, my brother's 15 months younger than I am. And my dad promised me he would, he would put me through school, whatever it took. He'd put me through school because his parents were educators and he didn't get that surprisingly. So I did everything I could to scholarship and then he paid the rest. And he also had a tree service that he opened. He, he was a steel worker. They closed the plant. He opened a tree service. So after I finished school, he gave the tree service to my brother well, my brother worked with him all along and he developed a skill he could climb. So he realized I can be a lineman. And so Jeff went on to be a lineman and then he started getting all of the extra certification so he can do hazard. He can do all these things. And on the side, he has this tree service and he's, 
I joke with my clients and, you know, we talk about 529s and what can you do? And, and I'm like, please don't discount how successful people can be. And I think we're going to see that even more because of how few people are in trades. But gosh, my last year in pharma, I was like top of the top. And he made the same amount of money with his tree service. <laughs> I'm like, but I'm supposed to be the successful one. So I'm still <laughs> battling to get there one day. One day, my goal is to be more successful than my my college not educated brother. Yeah, uh, Matt says my uncle works for Alabama Power and does that same thing on the side. They make a killing. Hey, I had to have a 200 and something year old tree, maybe been 300 tree cut down, $4,500. They did it in a day, $4,500, you know, in a day. It was amazing. So why do we as a society propel the myth that you must go to college? And I feel weird talking to you guys who are here in college, but why do we, why do we continue to insist that our kids, they've all got to go to college? I don't think we're insisting. I think, our generation isn't so much. Most of our class, I would, I would, well, I'm surprised. What's his name? Nick's not here. Cause Nick is like the traditional college kid, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, the rest mm -hmm. of us are like, we've got our little kids at home. And so we've all kind of figured out. And my husband was non-traditional. So he got his bachelor's and he, I think he was 33 when he finished. So he realized this is what I need for the next step. I think the problem is where we tell children, children, they have to go to college and they have to make up their mind what they want to be. And yet here, a lot of our generation is saying, you know, I was in my thirties before I hit the career industry that I wanted to be in. Um, so Rhett, y'all, he's so smart. My little one I was like, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? He's like, mom, I don't have to make that decision for a very long time. Good. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> so I, mean, I think Russell told him that you're right. <laughs> Well, okay. and another reason that they go to college, though, is because we'll throw fifty or hundred thousand dollars in free money in loans that they believe is free money to an eighteen-year-old who can't balance a checkbook to encourage them to go to college. The student loan system is broken, y'all. I think it's the think education it's, uh, over marketing. And if marketing happens, it's because somebody's making money from it. Like if we would teach our children, somebody makes money from it. Like yesterday, I had a Medicare seminar here and the lady was like, there's Medicare and there's Medicare Advantage. And all you hear about on TV is Medicare Advantage. So you need to be aware of that. And I was like, click, it's marketing. They're making money off of it. Be aware. Isabel, what were you going to say? I think it's the whole education system. Um, in my banking career that I started when I was 21 years old, I started in it as a teller and I could only get to a certain level without a degree. Like they, they make it so difficult for you to move up into a position Um at least in the banks that I worked for, you had to have at least a bachelor's degree to get past that hump. And I, that's why, that's what made me go to school. Um, I told my daughter, Olivia, you know, she's got to get a college education if she wants to get anywhere in this world too. I just feel like you have to have that piece of paper just to get a good job. Well, and the problem too comes from, does the piece of paper that you have help you with the job? You know, like you just have to have a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. I was yeah. five degrees in agricultural business and I was a drug rep for five years. And one of my colleagues had a degree in building science and we were selling antidepressants. <laughs> like, Why did she need to study building science to sell pills? Well, and why do I need two college courses of biology to do finances? 
Like it's just, it's, they just want money. It's, it's all about the money. And that's why tuition is so high mm -hmm. because there are too, it's like inflation. There are too many dollars chasing too few degrees and the free money makes the college go, oh, wow, they can borrow as much as they want to. Let's increase tuition. Can you imagine what tuition would be if there were no student loans? Colleges would be begging for people to come, right? We wouldn't have all these great, wonderful, nice buildings and all the, the super stuff that we have. When I first started going to college back in 2003, um, my two, my four classes that I took at New Mexico, um, the University of New Mexico, I think I paid a total of $435 for four classes. You can't even get that for one credit now. It's insane how much college is. Yeah, I think when I went to Jack State, I think it was $1,500 a semester or maybe $1,500 a year for two semesters. I mean, it's crazy, you know, and I thought that was a lot of money back then. But now the you know, tuition is just out of control, out of control. So one of, my, one of my best friends is a professor of biology at Auburn, and she said, you know, tuition is way high. Um, I know it's the opposite school and you guys know where I stand, but we Auburn had a record setting um, application year this past year. And she said she gets to where some of the students on campus, they don't even care about what she's teaching. She's a biology professor. So you, sorry, Isabel, you'd have to take her class, you know, <laughs> but, and she's tough. But the thing is, she said, these kids don't care. They don't, they don't really listen. And she said, it's, it's one of those, and her husband's a CFO for a company. So they're not hurting, but she said, I drive up in an older vehicle and these kids are driving Porsches around. And so there's so much money being thrown by people that can't afford it. And then you have money that's being thrown from people who can't afford it. And there's this completely unrealistic expectation for these young children of this is real. And why am I driving this and someone else is driving that, whether they can afford it or not. So it goes back to what we talked about. But she said it's almost like they don't value the education that they're paying for. And I think most of us here are like, I need this class for whatever purpose. And we, it gets tough when you're in a class with a bunch of people. And fortunately, at the master's level, it's not the case. But you're in class. I had to tell one girl in, in college, like, would you shut up? I need this class. <laughs> <laughs> she don't like me the rest of the semester. And I care. I'm about to pull my kids out of public school and just teach them myself because of that same thing. They're not learning anything because the teacher spends more time with the kids who don't want to be there, but they have to be there. And then I have to teach them at home anyways. So. Well, that's like uh, my daughter, the old school that she went to. I asked, what are you doing in math class? They watch Little House on the Prairie every day in math class. Now, nothing against Little House on the Prairie. I love it. There's a lot of good life lessons in Little House on the Prairie. But at the same time, you know, you would think in a math class, you're going to be learning math. It's crazy. Okay. So I want you to be involved in your community. That's the thing. I hope you take out of this class. You be involved. We can't change the world, but maybe we can change the world for one person. Right? We can't change the world but maybe we can change the world for one person. As a financial planner, that's what you have the ability to do. So Katie may not have 500 clients. That's too many. Maybe she's got 50, maybe she's got 40, maybe she's got 20, I don't know. But help change the world for those. That's, that's the best I think that we can have you to do. And increase your circle of influence and try to influence those around you uh, so that they know that there are options. 
All right, good. So, yeah, it was very sad watching the uh, the retirement gamble. Let's talk about uh, one of your discussions on Hedge Fundy's excellent adventure. Any comments on that? And I'm assuming that everyone has done that assignment yet. If you haven't got to it, just tell me. There's no, you know, we all have grace until April 30th when everything's due. But any any comments on Hedge Fundy's excellent adventure? I just wanted you to see that there are some things called triple leverage ETFs. They're extraordinarily volatile. They some may call them dangerous. They're risky, but at the same time, uh, there are people who put their entire accounts into something like that. Any comments on the Hedge Fundy's excellent adventure with UPro and TML? I think I have to bring mine up in order for me to remember what I put on mine. Okay. Mm. So I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. it's not some kind of sp specific strategy like the wheel. It's just an, a, a separate like index fund, right? Yeah. That so there's two. Just One three of, times. Yeah. Three. A uh, UPro is like, three times the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 goes up 1%, you make 3% in UPRO. If it goes down, you If also it goes lose. down 1%, you lose 3%. And so the rationale is, is over time, the market goes up. So UPRO is, is um, something that works quite well in markets that go up. Isabel, did you find yours? I did. Um, I put what I put in mind was I'll just read it out loud. Mm -hmm. I thought that in our class lecture, Dr. Gaines said that having bond having bonds in your portfolio were not necessary until you were in the pre uh, preservation phase of the investing life cycle. I think I remember you saying that. Yeah, if if like for my daughter. She says, Dad, my economics teacher is telling me bad stuff. I said, what? He's saying that I need bonds. And I said, well, he's telling you about bonds. He wants you to know about them. At 18, you don't need bonds. When you get, you know, 45, 50, we may add some bonds to your thing. You need all equity exposure right now. That's just what you need. You need you need growth. So, uh, but there's a purpose for the TML in that portfolio. And the TMF is supposed to say, well, when stocks do poorly, bonds do well. That's why they were adding the uh, 40% or whatever the percentage was into TMF. Now, the problem is this. What happened during the year 2022? Anybody? The worst bond market in history. And one of the worst stock markets in history was crazy double down yeah so let me Good show time you. to harvest for taxes yeah time to harvest for taxes let me share my screen and i just ran a 64 uh portfolio from 2010 let's look at this humongous drawdown everyone see this so your portfolio was you know up here this is starting with ten thousand dollars you end up with ninety four thousand this is going from 2010 uh, this is 60% UPRO and 40% TML. Look at this, y'all. This is December 31st, 2021. Look at 2022. Boy, that was a big hit in that portfolio, right? Big hit. But I just wanted you to, and I didn't want to show you guys this to go for any other reason than to let you know there are different strategies out there that people are trying. And if I were here and I were 19 years old, would I have my daughter go into you pro? Maybe, but I didn't, I had her go into VOO. I said, let's just do the prudent thing. I don't want her to take these wild, wild rides. Right. So let's look what UPRO would have done during the same period. Let's, I mean, you put no, uh, uh, SPY. If you had done a hundred percent SPY, let's just see what that portfolio looks like. 
you wouldn't expect the the, the volatility of that. Yeah. Right. So here's portfolio two, and you see that it's a much steadier increase, right? Steadier increase. Of course, it's still underperformed the UPRO TMF, but you've got to be able to stomach this. And I will tell you unapologetically, I had a portfolio that was in a similar position in 2022 except I was in a more volatile position. Instead of three times the S&P 500, I was three times the NASDAQ. And talk about a killing. I got killed. And I probably went in here, dumb Bobby, right? Dumb Bobby goes in here. So I had a significant loss going into March. And finally, I said, I know this is a long-term position. If I hold it, it's going to probably do fine. But I bailed on it. I just took my losses and 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 got out of it. But I did want to at least show you guys that. All right. Any other comments on on the the hedge fundies excellent adventure? I just thought that was interesting for you guys, just to introduce you to something totally different. All right. How are you guys doing in uh, the little book? Uh, by the little book of common sense investing by Bogle. Everybody making progress in that? Before we go on to chapter seven or to uh, week seven, let's see. Week seven. Give me one second. Week seven. All right. How many of you have completed uh, week seven discussion, your life's masterpiece? You're a magnificent human being. Now allow your magnificent self to follow these directions. Take a blank sheet of paper. Draw a circle on the paper. Take about 10 minutes to tra transform the paper into an artistic masterpiece that conveys your life story. Once completed, upload your masterpiece via Blackboard. Comment on the masterpieces of at least two of the classmates, and I look forward to seeing your art. How many of you completed that? Is, does anybody mind sharing that? Can you share your screen? I think I've got it set up to you. Share your screen if you can. Do you have that, or do you mind, want me to go in and see if I can find yours? I have mine. Katie, can you share it? Yeah. Let's see your masterpiece. That was drawn at the Starbucks in Guntersville. Oh, wow. Okay, talk to us. It looks like glasses and we got all kinds of stuff. Walk us through this. So that's my, my oldest. I used to be really good at art. He's six. That's my baby. He's almost 21 months. Um, I'm Christian. I like music. I'm married to Russell. What's that ugly sign right there? Where I can't you? understand that. Where you go? Okay, got you. And I, I threw the A down there, and it's crooked, like most people in the state of Alabama on their cars. They can't put the Alabama A on their car straight. They always make it crooked, so I did it like that. Do you know how to tell the difference between the Alabama A and the Atlanta Braves A? Yeah, the the tilty mohawk. Yeah, the Alabama A has a mullet, right? Yeah, yeah, the mullet. It has a mullet, yeah. Okay. Good. Sharon said I'm going to get kicked out of class. Um <laughs> She is a massive Alabama fan. <laughs> um, and then, so this is my 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 personal life. I love like cowgirl boots or bare feet um, and good country music. That's my thing. Um, I wear glasses all the time. And then over here on the left side, my degree's in agriculture. So that's not a train. That's a tractor. My first job out of college was with a John Deere dealership. This, of course, is the market. Um those are pills and needles for <laughs> thing for pharma. <laughs> and then I was at Starbucks. I ended up doing a lot of meetings at coffee shops. And I think I responded, I think it was Isabel's post, but it was like, don't spend money on coffee. And I was like, if that $5 of coffee is going to make me $50 that day, I will spend $5 every morning. Um, so, and of course, more music, listening to music throughout the day. Um, that, that, 
work it, by is there a uh, is there a bigger significance or meaning uh by the, the the glasses you said you wore glasses a lot but is there a, is that a bigger meaning uh is that or is it just how you like glasses and you just read glasses i mean i could draw a circle and so i have the work-life balance so it kind of is a bridge between the two mm -hmm. and where i work and where i live they're 45 minutes apart and i i joke with my clients i'm probably not going to run into you at the grocery store when I'm not wearing makeup. And that's why I don't really want to live in this town. You know, they laugh about it. Um, if our school system doesn't get better, we might live here. But I was sitting at Starbucks and I had taken my, I normally wear aviators, but I had taken this pair of glasses off and I'd set it down and I drew the circle and I was like, how neat would that be? That's very good. Very good. Can someone else share theirs? Isabel, you have yours or? Um, hang on. Let me find it. Matt, what is your degree in? Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay. Talk to us. I had to throw some color in there because I like color, mm -hmm. but first I just started off with the circle because I didn't really know what I was, <clears throat> where I was going, but I drew the circle first and um, drew my family. So the blue is my husband, pink is me and purple is Olivia. And then I got my two little dogs, just in case you couldn't really make out what those were. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you got Texas on your uh, necklace, too. So Texas is very important. Yes, that's where I was born. Um, and then Alabama football is where I fell in love with. And that's why I go to Alabama. Um, and then... I really like gardening, so I turned it into a flower with a lot of sunshine because I don't get enough of that here in Alaska. Wow, that's awesome. I love it. The birds, do they mean anything up top? or No, I just put them in there. Just put them to, in the sky? Yeah. Now, I wonder how many of us went to Alabama because we love Alabama football. Don't you know there's a lot of us that did that? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I love that you said that, hey, I'm in Alabama because I love Alabama football. I'm the same way. That's why I went to Alabama too. Yeah. I love Alabama I, football. I am originally a Longhorns fan, diehard, will always be. But so when Alabama plays uh, Texas, I'm Switzerland. But um in 2009, when they beat Texas Longhorns, I fell in love with, um, oh, what was, uh, what was his name? It put me on the spot now, but uh, he won the Heisman. He literally was like a miniature Emmett Smith. Mark. Was it uh, Mark Ingram? Uh, uh, Ingram, yes. Yeah, went, Mark Ingram. Yes. Yeah. He... I fell in love with that kid and I started following him. Um, and that's what made me an Alabama fan after watching that game when we lost, when Texas lost, but Alabama won. Wow. That's awesome. Great. Love we it. have his autograph. So I could just like, you know, if Russell gets really, really bad, I could just mail you the football from that year. Oh, That would be amazing. My husband used to work on the sidelines in Tuscaloosa. And so he'd always go over there and I'd tailgate in Auburn. And it was wonderful. And now we don't watch the games together. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, Caitlin, do you have yours to share or do you want to share it or no? Or I haven't done mine yet. Okay. I'm right. one of those, like, I will think on something for like weeks 
<laughs> and then I'll just sit down and do it real fast. Otherwise, I'll sit and just stare at it. Well, this is just one of those little fun things that I like to say. It just tells me a lot about the students. It just lets me uh, know about you a little more. Normally, so Kaylin's going to go, oh, I'm not going to do it that way. Normally, when I give the assignment, your assignment, uh, people will draw a circle that will take up the entire page, and they'll put all their little pictures of stuff on the inside of the circles. So it's always interesting to me. A lot of times when I see that, I'll see that, and I'll kind of interpret those people to be inside the box type thinkers. And uh, then there are those who will draw a, a small circle and will put the pictures outside of the circle. And I normally classify those as outside the box thinkers. But it's just kind of interesting, not saying that that's true or not, but it gives me a good insight into, into each of you. All right. So I appreciate your life's masterpiece. The last thing I want to talk to you about today is in week seven, and it was the week of seven assignment of this is Beth and I, several years ago, got to go on a date night, which we seldom do without children. And we wanted to go to the movies, and we wanted to see something that was non-animated, since everything that we watch is animated. And we didn't know anything that was playing, but there was this thing called The Greatest Showman. I said, what the crap is this? And we went in, and it soon became my favorite film of all time. And we, I had you to watch a behind-the-scenes video of Kiala Settle. Tell me about the experience that you had with that. She played the bearded lady in the film. Uh, have, have you watched that yet? Okay, Katie, tell me about it. So, <laughs> I don't know if you've read mine yet, but it's pretty, like, in your face I was actually going through a discrimination case someone had stepped a little too far out of the line with me being female at work and so I just I let it all come out through my fingers when I was typing that that oh, letter wow. I can't wait to read it <laughs> so it it was I'm looking at it and it's like I can stand firm in the fact that, you know, things are okay. And so I looked at trying to connect this back to the markets and how to do that. Because I think that was like how you're supposed to look at it. But um, it was also a matter of making sure that my boys know to treat women. And I don't like to get off on that, but it's what I was going through. Sure. I, I, I want to make sure that women are treated fairly. I think I had like two things that I completed for you that week. I'm sorry, but it's, I'm not sorry. Um, it's, I'm looking at, I was like, by design, women seek security. Um, we need to know that from our male counterparts. And then I was like, take a look at what females need versus um, the biggest risk that you take and who you are. And yeah, it's, it's in there. <laughs> okay. I can't wait to read it. But what is just so inspiring to see her when she walked out from behind that podium and just like yeah. gave it all. Oh, it was great. Yeah. Isabel, what do you think about it? Any, any thoughts that you could add? I, I think I've heard that song before, but I did not know that it was from that show. Um, and literally had me crying and happy at all at the same time. I loved it. I think I want to steal it for my theme song. Yeah, I don't blame you. Caitlin, have you had a chance to watch it yet? I did. Um, I remember watching the movie and like in the middle of hearing that song, I'm like Googling it, like adding it to my playlist. So that's like, you know, going to work, get pumped, like, it's okay. These kids are going to run you over, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, and let me ask the three of you one final question as I let you go. She had a podium in front of her that was kind of protecting her. It was, but it was an obstacle to her making that song her own. And she finally just shoved it out of the way and came out from behind the podium. What is there that stands in front of you that prevents you from obtaining the success or the life that you desire? Yeah, maybe that's part of what resonated with me was because with what I was going through, I was pushing that podium out of the way. 
for me. Yeah. And it was a comment was made. How am I going to be a wife and mother and, um, and think that I would be successful in this job when I got interviewed. And then that same person made the comment of what had, I, what did like, you, you did the most detrimental thing you could do by getting pregnant. Like you can't mm. do this. Mm. And then he went after my clients. And so I finally was like, see you later. And I don't, I look at it. It's like, I don't have to compete with him. No. Because that's lowering myself to compete. But as long as I serve people well, then I really don't see there being a podium in my way other than just meeting the right people. And it would be wasting my time. Like if there was a podium that I was going to put there, it would be wasting my time on things that don't matter. And unfortunately having to take him and remove that, it did slow me down in my profession, but it also like, you know, and I was very open with it at home. So my boys know, like get it out of the way and keep going. Um, I think it could also be that sometimes I allow my own self to be my podium of getting in my head too much. And so it's a matter of get out of your head. And that's where we don't, I think is, you know, no matter what you're doing or what you've got in your life, everybody has multiple aspects of their life. They're having to balance. Is it a family at home? Is it school? Is it a job? Is it, and too many people don't have anything that they have developed to be um, a release for them. And so I said, I've got to have something. So like last night I went and rode horses just because that's something. And so if I feel that podium, whatever it may be, starting to creep back up, it's knowing how to get out from behind it again. Well, the good thing is you didn't let those comments, you know, knock you down. And oh, you know, they had the opposite effect. I think it motivated like, you. Didn't what it? did I do? Yeah. I mean, and that person didn't realize that you bringing children into the world is the most precious of all things that you could do, you know, it actually made me, I looked at it and the, the full year after maternity leave, both in my pharma job and here have both been my most successful years. There's something about a child, whether it's to a, a mom or to a father that I believe motivates people to work harder and more efficiently. Yeah, because, you know, we are living out a pattern of how things should be to our children, right? I mean, we are their role model. Now, when you've got two teenagers in the house, as I've got, you know, a lot of times, you know, you think that they don't see it, but they will. They will see it. We're their, we're their role model. We may not be the coolest person to be around uh, with them and their friends, but, uh, you know, we're a role model for them. Kaylin, did anything come up to you as far as a podium that's standing before you and, and, and living the life that you want to live? It's pretty much what Katie said. Um my own mind is my biggest podium. Like I've always felt like if I didn't have the knowledge right then and there that maybe somebody else did, like, I don't want to say that they were better than me. I just felt like they were smarter than me and they, I don't know, should kind of take the lead on things. Mm -hmm. Not really in that way, but it, it would just hold me back. Like thinking, Oh, I can't meet them where they are. So that was kind of it. It was like, you know what? No, I'm capable of learning anything that anybody else is. And whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, but just kind of opening that mindset up, that podium removal is like kind of where I'm at right now is just thinking that I don't have to wait. I don't need other people to help me get to where I am. Like if I'm going to do this, I have to do it myself and I'm going to do it now. And your own toughest critic is you, right? And so, yeah, it, sometimes our mind tries to limit what we can achieve. And so allowing ourselves to get outside of that and to achieve things greater than we even thought we could accomplish, I mean, it's, it's really an incredible thing. You know, I, I had my wisdom teeth taken out on uh, Monday. And while I was on the Valium, and the laughing gas, you know, the nitrous oxide, 
man, I could have run through a building if I needed to at the time, you know? And I, I think about how oftentimes we're limited. We limit ourselves in what we can do. So, you know, be able to think outside that box. That's why I had you guys to do that thing. I want you to think outside the boundaries of what you think is possible. Because I think you can all achieve extraordinary things. I really believe that. I mean, you're, I, I know from the three of you, and there's a lot of people in here, and of course I pick on you guys because I can see you, but uh, you three are very extraordinary people who are capable of so much. It's just amazing to see, uh, you know, what you're capable of. Isabel, anything for you that, that you felt like was a limitor on you or your achievements? Um, I think it's probably the same myself. I just get into my own head and I struggle. I struggle with myself sometimes. <clears throat> it, for me, it's my, because I'm basically only go to school right now, but um, I get really stressed out if I'm like not doing well in a class and well, you're not stressed by this class because you're doing no, great. Not at all. Like this, this class, I, I think I tell you a couple of times within my um, discussions that this class is the best class that I've had in Alabama so far. Um, but yeah, I just, for me, it's, it's my own self, my, and I'll go to my husband and tell him, you know, I'm going to fail this class. And but in the end, I end up always getting a B or an A. So I think it's the the fear of me getting a C is terrifying for me. <laughs> well, and release that pressure. Release that pressure. Um, I remember, you know, I was valedictorian in my, my high school class. I only made one B in college, and it's because I missed the final. I didn't know they did a final on a different day, so I got a zero on it, and I made a B in speech. Uh, made all A's in my master's program, and I was putting too much pressure on me. When I got to the Ph.D. level, I said, screw this. Oh, I'm I, said, not going there. I, I said, I'm ready for a B. I said, give me a B, and I made two Bs, you know? And the cool thing is, when you get your Ph.D., guess what they still call you? Dr. Bob, you know, I mean, it's not, it's like, they didn't go, oh, you made two Bs or you made a C, you know, uh, yeah. Isabel, relieve some of that, relieve some of that stress on you. I try. I, yeah. I try. Relieve, you know, go sit there and go, oh man, hey, I made a C, you know, hey, you know, that's, I passed. Uh, I want you to achieve great things, but I want you to put undue pressure on you. All right, any questions or comments about anything we talked about today or anything that's coming up in the future? Has everybody completed your final exam? I'm a little behind on grading, so I don't know what everybody has done. Not your final exam, your 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 first exam. I did. Okay. I'm all caught up. You're all caught up. Good, 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 good. Well, if you're not, don't worry about it. Uh, April 30th is our day, right? All right, guys, roll tide and... Uh, Go Eagles or whatever they say over there. So <laughs> I have a question for Katie. Yeah, Caitlin's got a question for Katie. Yeah. So like an hour, it's probably more like two hours. I might have fallen down a rabbit hole. So I um I started reading about charitable remainder trusts. Huh? Do you is that something okay? So I understand that monthly payments can be taken out to the non-charitable beneficiary. And then at the end, that money would go to a charitable organization. Does that money have to go to a charitable organization or would it, could you set it up to go to your beneficiaries? So I don't do too instead. much charitable remainder trust, but we do a donor advised fund and it eliminates mm -hmm. a lot of the legal aspect of that. And that one can be set up to where it's our, it's irrevocable. So it cannot mm -hmm. come back to the beneficiary in the fund that we have. Um, but I could, like, if I am charitable and I pass, I could set it up to, like, whichever one of my sons is more charitable. And he would become essentially the custodian over that money and to which charities it goes to. Does that make sense in a way? Um, it does. Yeah, 
I think I'm looking for something like really specific. So you wanted to come yeah. back to your... that answer. That helps. Have you taken yeah. a States yet? I have, but the problem was when I took it, you all were of the terms too, were like foreign to me. So now I'm hearing them again and I'm going, crap, this would have been a great question to ask had I really grasped the concept. Mm -hmm. Basically what I'm looking for is a trust that I can put money in annually, I guess. And that was kind of what I hit a roadblock with some of them was it was a one-time thing and you could only build income within what's already in there. So I was looking for something that would I could keep putting money into yet get the monthly payments for either the beneficiary or for the charitable organization. And then at the end of the term, the money would either come to me or go to my kids, not just be stuck with the charitable organization that's mine, you know, and that would be the end of it. Probably, you know better because my where my mind immediately goes is if you get some kind of deduction or tax write-off for that then you're not getting that money back but I I took taxes at the same time I took a states last semester so I don't yeah. know what I learned <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I don't know if you were in that class too I'm like what just happened uh yeah I think I did tax planning last semester too yeah. So and I learned a lot I'm in right that class. Charitable remainder trust. And because we do the donor advice fund and it's different, I'm more well-versed in that. Okay. But you can't get the I'll keep, um, I'll keep digging my rabbit hole. And if I have any, if I have any more specific questions, I'll ask you next week. Yeah. Okay, guys. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.